right, my Bible in 365, brothers and sisters, we have arrived at the amazing book of Amos. And folks, I got to tell you, it really is truly an amazing book. I want to say this. I want to make myself very, very clear. Amos, of course, is categorized, and I say this a lot with the minor prophets, as a minor prophet, but as I have said many times before, there is nothing minor about the prophet Amos. The reason why he's called the minor prophet is because the body of work happens to be a smaller body of work. It refers to the size of the writings. And of course, all nine very power-packed chapters of Amos are remarkable and they are powerful. And Amos, in my opinion, may be one of the most interesting prophets that I know of uh, for a lot of reasons. By the way, uh, there's a lot of them that are very interesting, but Amos just takes the cake, especially when it comes to the things that he writes at the end of chapter nine. By the way, more on that to come because I actually did a video where I spoke extensively on Amos chapter nine on my YouTube channel that you should go to because it's heavy. It speaks about the future of the nation of Israel. And it was a video that I released just a few days ago. And it's pretty powerful stuff. Now, let's talk about some interesting facts regarding Amos. First of all, we know several things about Amos that are really, really unique. First of all, we read about an earthquake in uh, chapter one, verse one in the book of Amos. And according to Josephus, we know that that was probably at the time when Uzziah was struck by leprosy, which we read about in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, which of course would place Amos's prophecy in about 750. Now that's really interesting because if you look at it from that perspective, then that means the two kings that were ruling during the time of Amos's ministry would have been King Uzziah of the southern kingdom of Judah and, of course, Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom of Israel. And, of course, the one who came after Jeroboam would have known who Amos was. And Amos had a lot of contemporaries. I would be willing to bet you that as a boy, Amos would have been able to hear the stories of Jonah going into Nineveh. He also would have known Elisha and heard him tell about his association with Elijah. It's very likely they knew each other because, again, they were part of the same area in the northern kingdom and the ministry that was going on. Understand that Jonah and Elisha were passing off the sort of prophetic stage while Amos was coming on. So there was sort of a handing of the baton. They would have known each other in crossing a little bit, kind of like what Jeremiah and Ezekiel did with one another, kind of the same sort of situation. Now, we know that Joel for sure, I think for sure, would have been a contemporary of Amos uh, or at the bare minimum, somebody who came very quickly after him. I think they were contemporaries. I think they actually got to know each other and their ministries may have started uh, uh, around the same time as each other. And it is very, uh, well, well, let me just say this. The reason why I think that's the case, because some people would argue with me on this, but the reason why I think that's the case is because the plague that we read about in the book of Joel, I think may have been referred to in Amos chapter four. And of course, Hosea may have very well also been in Bethel at the time that Amos went to go visit the city of Bethel. So this is interesting. We say Bethel, but still, uh, Hosea, well, of course, would have been the younger and would have continued his work uh, substantially longer than Amos because Amos would have been older and he would have died off at that point or gone to be with the Lord. And of course, it's interesting. I would also be willing to bet you that Isaiah and Micah were probably beginning the work of their prophetic ministry when Amos was very likely ending his. So they were contemporary. He was contemporaries with a lot of the great prophets. And it's pretty remarkable when you kind of think of the whole picture of everything that had happened during that time and something that should get everybody excited because the story of what happened to them is absolutely remarkable and the things that took place are uh, really powerful. Now, I wanna say this because Amos spends a lot of time talking about the judgment of Israel. As a matter of fact, when you get into the first couple chapters of Amos, you actually deal with Israel's surefire demise 
and it becomes really, really uh, obvious that God is getting ready to destroy Israel when you get into chapter three. And by the way, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the northern kingdom of Israel versus the southern kingdom of Judah, because God begins to describe the luxury that existed within the context of the capital of the northern kingdom, which would have been Samaria. And in essence, you get to one of the most fearful chapters of the book of Amos, where in chapter three, you get a description of the luxury and the decadence of the capital city, and then goes into chapter four, where it pretty much says, hey, prepare to meet your maker, <laughs> prepare to meet your God. Like that's a heavy thing. And then of course, we learn about the day of God, the coming captivity, the uh, three visions that Amos had that all related to the destruction of Israel. Uh, and of course, the very famous prophecy related to what was known as the basket of ripe fruit. That of course, was a very uh, powerful one in that, the picture there was, it is inescapable, literally inescapable, the consequence of the sin that you are going to face uh, or the consequences that you're going to face as a result of your sin. And the picture of fruit being ripened is sort of an idea that constantly reminds us of the fact that God, even in his judgment, will wait until the right time, and then he will destroy what it is that needs to be judged or destroyed. By the way, we see a picture of this even in the idea of grapes and the idea of God ripening grapes. We read about this in the book of Revelation and many other areas in the Old Testament. Revelation, of course, being the New Testament. But this is God basically speaking about the fact that the timing will be perfect for his judgment and all will know that God is just in that judgment. But when we get to Amos chapter 9, let me tell you something really special about that chapter I love that chapter. I think that chapter is incredible. As a matter of fact, one of the most joyous experiences that I have had in recent times was when the Consul General of Israel had just finished his assignment here in, uh, in Southern California. I was able to go to his going away ceremony as he was going to the foreign minister's office. He was a really wonderful man, still is a wonderful man, very dear friend of mine. And so I had the privilege of being able to speak at his ceremony and I got to share the book of Amos that basically tells us that the nation of Israel will never be plucked out of their land again. And it's such a powerful prophecy. I would highly recommend, by the way, uh, let me just say this, forget the high recommendation. Here's your homework assignment. Go to my YouTube channel, James Cadiz, and find the video that I did a few days ago that deals with the subject of Amos, where we talk about the Amos chapter nine prophecy, and it's a powerful one. And basically, this is the video that talks about God knowing the future of Israel or telling us what the future of Israel is going to be. You are going to love it. It is going to be powerful and very eye-opening because we have a God who is amazing. Folks, we have a God who is filled with grace. We have a God that is filled with power. And undoubtedly, we have a God that knows what he's doing. And it's time that we honor him the way he deserves to be honored. Now, speaking of which, I will say this. I am so proud of you guys. You have been honoring God by your dedication and your commitment to the word of God. And on behalf of Charlie and Erica Kirk, I just want to say we are proud of you and overjoyed over your commitment to the things of God. By the way, we got a Q&A coming in the in the month I say <laughs> in the month of August. I just pulled a Joe Biden there. Oh, so sorry. Anyway, <laughs> we have a Q&A coming in the month of August. It's going to be a great one. I'm looking forward to it. It's been a few months, but we are excited to be able to pour into you, to minister to you and equip you with the word of God. God bless you guys. It's a real honor for me to serve you. Love you guys. God bless you.